Uh, welcome everybody. We'll just give people a couple more minutes to trickle in from the waiting room. Well, welcome everybody to this second stop in our Tidal Power Express event series. Um, just a bit of housekeeping first. Uh, this webinar is recorded to make you all aware and we'll be doing the question and answer through the Q&A function of Zoom. So please put any questions as we go along in there. So we are the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult, the UK's leading technology innovation and research centre for offshore renewables. And I'm Alex Loudon, a Senior Technology Acceleration Manager at the Catapult. And I'm Heather McClarty, Project Manager, working in the same team as Alex, where we specialise in disruptive innovation. In this series, we're showcasing the companies we're working with under our major technology innovation projects. We've posted a link for further reading after the event if you'd like to know any more about our work in the Tidal Stream arena. This time we're visiting a company based in Orkney, but with a nationwide network of sites in Edinburgh, the Isle of Wight, North Wales and the English Channel region region. Our guest for this week's tour is Andrew Scott, CEO of Orbital Marine Power. Uh, good afternoon, Andrew. Good afternoon. Delighted to be joining. So, Andrew, before we get into the nitty gritty of the technologies and sites, I'd like to ask you to give us the Orbital Marine Power story in a nutshell, just for our viewers who are new to the sector. So, we're a Scottish renewable energy company. Uh, predominantly an engineering company. And uh, for 20 years, uh, we've been developing a, a fairly unique technology that's focused on delivering a cost change in harnessing uh, tidal stream currents. Thanks, Andrew. So let's start with a look at your latest turbine model and find out a bit more about how it works and the types of locations in which you're currently deploying your devices. So I think there'll be an image shared to the screen as well, so all the viewers can um, have something to refer to. Give that a minute. And then we'll just talk through it. So hopefully you can all see that now and it should start to move in animation. So Andrew, I wonder if you could talk us through, what are we seeing here? So the big first thing to note is that our technology is, does not, is not mounted on the seabed. In fact, it floats on the surface. And that's a conceptual benefit, which we believe through experience of operating and working in the hostile environment of a tidal site is absolutely the keys to unlocking doing this cost effectively. So the turbine that you see um, for all extents and purposes is similar to a vessel, um, but it has got two arms that you see coming down. And at the end of that, we house our, our power generating uh, drive trains with big, big rotors that capture the fast moving current. The main structure on the top, the main tube, acts as our hull, it's our main buoyancy vessel, and that has all the power conversion equipment and uh, isolation and controls and auxiliary systems. So all very readily available, easy to access with low cost vessels once the machine's installed on site. It's installed onto pre-existing, pre-installed and fairly simple anchor systems uh, and a subsea cable and a dynamic cable which takes the electricity from the machine back to the shore substation. The other interesting feature, um, proprietary feature that we have in the technology is, is these legs that are actually actuated. So they're driven by a hydraulic um, mechanism that means that in the downward position that you can see here at the start, um, that's where we're generating power. Um, and then at the press of a button, the legs can actually be actuated and bring the entire drivetrain assembly up to the surface very quickly. 
um, so that we can get low cost access for all the major components. So what you see in front of you is the culmination of 20 years of R&D, as I said, and experience of delivering grid connected scaled machines. Um, and we believe it re represents and presents a, a totally different cost and risk profile for a tidal stream project, principally because we can build it very cheaply, we can install it very cheaply, um, and we can um, maintain and operate it very cheaply and, crucially, keep it generating power. Um, we've just built this, uh, uh, through the 20 years, we've developed and developed, we've delivered technology at different scales, including a 250 kilowatt uh, floating turbine, which is the first, world's first floating tidal turbine back in 2011. Uh, we built a two megawatt machine prototype system in 2015. And recently we built this O2 turbine um, and grid connected it up in Orkney. It's the world's most powerful tidal turbine uh, rated at two megawatts. Thanks very much. And yes, yeah, it's, it's so interesting and you've almost covered off a few of my other questions already but if you were to pick a few things then what makes this design unique pretty much everything um, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean it, it, it is very novel and and actually that's an important point but right from a very high architecture concept level it is unique and we do have intellectual property protection at that level so it's a very interesting business um, proposition that we hold because we believe this technology is the enabling technology for low-cost tidal stream energy and it's not really the drivetrain. Drivetrains have a lot of value, a lot of expensive components, a lot of engineering in there, with very little intellectual property in many instances to protect a market position. We for a long time have understood that the real enabling technology here is what you bolted your drivetrains to. And we have that uh, very sophisticated and well engineered and very well protected. Well, thanks, Andrew. And to reiterate then, so how much power can be produced from this turbine? We have a nameplate rating of two megawatts with the O2. Um, actually, technically and physically, we have more like two and a quarter megawatts of power generation on board. So um, we have 20 meter rotor diameters here. That means that the turbine, well, it, it reaches rated power at 2.5 meters per second. At that point, uh, we'll be generating a little bit over two megawatts of power. Amazing. And thinking about the reliability of your turbine, so how tried and tested is this and how many demonstrations and things like that have been done? Uh, as I said, um, we have built a full scale machine before. Well, when I say full scale, two megawatt machine before. Um, and that was very, very successfully demonstrated at EMEC in 2016 through to 2018. We're actually in a 12 month period of generation or testing as a prototype. It generated more power into the Scottish grid than all the other marine technologies had in 12 years in Scotland prior to the launch of the SR2000. Now, actually, um, I will hasten to add, we did do a lot of service and maintenance and inspection interventions on the uh, O2, on the SR2000, and we are on the O2. Um, but actually, that is the beauty and the validation of it, is that no single maintenance intervention on the turbine cost us more than a few hundreds of pounds to take a low cost vessel out. Um, and we were able to do it in uh, hours, if not minutes, in many instances. So despite Doing a lot of interventions to do inspections, servicing, all these sorts of things, we achieved an incredibly high level of availability, especially considering it was a prototype system. Thanks, Andrew. And thinking of practicalities like manufacturing and install installing, sorry, you describe it as simplified in your online information. Are you able to go into this at all? Yeah, so we're trying to remove. Uh, the site sensitivity around construction. Um, and we can do that because our reference is the sea surface, it's the water, it is a vessel. So um, we can approach it from uh, making the system into a, into, a, into a product for the most part of it. 
the only interface and the, the sensitivity around the specific sites, the anchors and the chains uh, and the cable. So the machine itself that you see here, um, we can tackle that from an engineering perspective to really try and simplify it. So, you know, use very um, strong structures or and simple manufacturing structures of just straight tubes. So the main tube itself is easier to manufacture than a, a wind turbine tower because it's not even tapered. Um, and we can do all that manufacturing um, and assembly work in very controlled environments of factories, shipyards, key sites, and all those sorts of things where we're not exposed to long construction windows on site um, that you know bring with them weather risk, vessel costs, all these types of things is that these are all done. These are activities that are all done in a factory context. Um, to give you an idea, when we installed the O2 um, from its temporary maintenance, from its temporary moorings to being connected on site, it took us less than four hours. And we used a vessel that really just had a 25 ton bollard pool. We, if we could have contracted that vessel on an hourly basis, we probably could have installed the world's most powerful tidal turbine for under a thousand pounds. So it's that level of de-risking that comes with the conceptual approach of productionizing uh, and tackling it from a floating perspective. Thanks so much, that's really so interesting. And before I hand over to Alex, one last question from me is, can you tell us about any work you're doing to generate hydrogen from your turbines? This is obviously such a new area that is emerging. Yeah, it's a very interesting area. I think it's a specifically interesting area as well for tidal stream because the one thing that pretty much everybody knows about tidal stream energy is it is 100% predictable. And that brings with it very interesting uh, economic and business propositions. Uniquely, you could warrant power, not availability of equipment. You could, you could warrant power and you could tell people exactly what amount of power and when you're going to produce it for the next 50 years if you want. So marrying and coupling that to other energy systems or battery storage is something that is of real interest. So the O2 turbine that we built now, um, connected into EMEC, um, has an electrolyzer, or I should say EMEC test center, have an electrolyzer on shore where we will be generating hydrogen that will be getting used in the local Orkney uh, economy to help decarbonize some of those more difficult areas that we know we have to now decarbonize, things like transportation, and domestic heating. So it's very exciting element of what we do is exploring these other avenues to utilize clean power. Thanks, Andrew. And I think we'll take uh, a few minutes to actually take some questions from the Q&A box. So um, without further ado, do you believe projects will be viable at 212 um, pounds per megawatt hour? Yes, I do. Yes, sure. Sweet answer. Good. Um, and what do we estimate the capital and operating costs per kilowatt hour for the unit? Is there a smaller unit? Sorry, so was there two questions there? Is it, is it a yeah, smaller yeah, unit so or a cost? Um, so, I mean, I can tell you from, um, from the O2 perspective, as a first off kind single unit that was built entirely by a third source party supply chain um, at a capital, reoccurring capital cost, we installed that, uh, manufactured, launched, threw it up to Orkney and installed it for approximately just inside five million pounds a megawatt. So we, and as a first off unit, we think that's an incredibly encouraging benchmark to hit and we are certainly very confident that that's a number that we can bring down by a large margin as we move towards volume. Um, so uh, what I would say as well, from a, from a proxy perspective, when we look at levelized cost of energy, um, steel is, is generally a very good proxy and at two and a quarter megawatt of effectively engineered capacity there, um, the O2 has, just over 200, 250 tonnes of fabricated steel in it, which actually compares very um, favourably with uh, offshore wind, uh, fixed offshore wind at that as well. So, um, so that again, 
gives us a lot of uh, a benchmark that gives us a lot of confidence that levelized cost of energy will be able to drop sharply from, uh, from our system. Thank you. Um, now we're at quarter past. I think I'll hand over to Alex and we'll try and get to the rest of the questions at the end. Yeah, thanks very much, Heather. So, um, and a reminder to viewers, you know, please do continue to put questions in the Q&A box and we'll get to as many of them as we can over the course of the next 15 minutes or so. Um, so, Andrew, I guess to, to move on the discussion from the device itself a little bit and, and more, I guess, to um, uh, to the projects that you're developing and, and, the, and the Orbital as a business, um, I think one of the questions alluded to the... Uh, the fact that there might be different sizes of the uh, the kind of orbital technology. Can you tell us about some of the different um, sites that you're developing, and if you're looking at using, a, you know, maybe larger or smaller versions of the same technology to uh, to address those site-specific requirements? Yeah. So, I mean, I think um, tidal stream as an industry built out will have its own, you know, it will have its own characteristics. Turbine scale will definitely be one of them. And that's not something that's dissimilar to wind. You know, you can still buy small scale wind turbines despite the top end of the market reaching 14, 15 megawatt turbines. So I think uh, the same will be the case for tidal stream. There'll be shallow water tidal streams or smaller project requirements that won't need large scale um, turbines. And as I said, our technology is a conceptual one. Our, our patents, our engineering have an enabling technology that scales to any size. I mean, ultimately, we actually think there's an application that could see the technology used in Run a River um, at small scale. And we built 250 kilowatt machine a decade ago and connected it. So absolutely, we think there's a range of applications and size. What we have focused on, taking a leaf and an understanding both from a a policy perspective and from an engineering perspective is that scale drives levelized cost of energy. So that is why for the last decade, we didn't stop at 250 kilowatt machine. And we pioneered and took the technology to a scale that nobody else has done, which is two megawatts. And do we think it will get bigger? Yes, for some sites that have deep enough water, yes, the technology will get bigger. And we've developed a technology that is already future-proof because the electrical architecture, unique electrical architecture that we can have on a floating platform that we can integrate into arrays. And what that means is that we believe at an early stage, we can deliver cost-effective energy at large utility scale. And we believe that is where the largest driving market will, will start first, yeah. And, and so you've got the O2 installed at the Falls of RMS in uh, at EMEC at the moment. What um, kind of are you exploring other sites for uh, deployments over the next coming years? Absolutely. You know, ultimately, we've got a vision that we want to see this technology developed and delivered uh, a global across a global market. So we are uh, the, the the most of our focus initially is on a UK market. You know, we think it makes sense. It's easier for us to resource as a company. We have a great supply chain and capability across the UK um, to build an industry. And it's important that we deliver uh, projects and capacity domestically if we want to really capture local supply chain opportunities. So that is why we've focused on the UK market. UK does have some great tidal stream market, uh, areas as well. But of course, um, it, we, it would be remiss of us if we were not looking uh, beyond our own shores. So we're interested in projects and regions uh, other side of the Atlantic, uh, in Canada, um, across the Channel, in France, and then further afield, places like Indonesia, Japan, and so forth. These are all areas that could hold large um, markets for our technology. So, yeah, exploring them all. And uh, I suppose, um, yeah, it does sound like a truly global market. There's a, a kind of relevant question in the chat there um, about a, a bit closer to home. And so, the question is what stops us installing an O2 at every Scottish coastal town? Um, you know, I guess that's maybe to do with resource availability. Yeah, so tidal stream is, is very locational specific. I think everybody should appreciate that. And, you know, compared to wind or solar, it's nowhere near as homogeneous or widely or largely found, you know. Um, so tidal stream is not, and I'm, very, I'm the first person to highlight, 
not the solution to climate change. It's a solution. And we believe it, play, it can play an important complementary role in the UK and other regions transition to net zero. Um, at a UK level, we definitely think it's gigawatts, but they are located in specific areas. So areas like, you know, Pentland Forest, North Scotland, Orkney, where we are, um, as your map kind of showed down the West Coast, Northern Ireland, Wales has some, some good resource, and indeed even on the South Coast around the Isle of Wight and there, those types of areas. So those are why we're specifically focused in those regions. So tidal stream just is, through its very nature, quite locational specific. And so you mentioned the, uh, the, I guess, the Isle of Wight and the Channel region um, there. And I guess that's one of our main areas of collaboration together is through the TIGER program um, funded through the Interreg program. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the work that Orbital are doing within that program? Yeah, um, so it's a, it's a fantastic, it's a really fantastic, for an engineering company, it's a fantastic opportunity for us and project for us to be working on. So um, we conceived the O2 technology some five years ago, actually, under a European funded project. And um, I have gone to construct it and build it, actually largely under a commercial mechanism of debt. But what O2 is, is, is a very well future-proofed piece of technology for innovation. Um, and what we're doing under Tiger is expending a lot of engineering effort, looking at the innovations so uh, that can help us reduce our cost of energy. The way that we've done that is that we've developed a digital twin of the system, and that allows us very cost effectively to do sensitivity analysis on innovations that we come up with. A whole range of innovations. That can be everything from you know, reducing the amount of steel in something, so we can test it then from a full life cycle, what's that do to the levelized cost of energy, to other things like sophisticated pitch control algorithms that reduce the amount of load that comes into the structure. That means that we can either reduce the steel content or increase the swept area and increase the amount of yield. So we can play tunes and do those sensitivity analysis. What that does then is it allows us to understand which innovations give us the quickest and the largest levelized cost of energy reduction. So, and then actually under the TIGER project, which we're then doing is pulling in third party experts um, from analogous industries. So for example, pitch control, bringing in pitch control experts from wind and looking at the strategies and the philosophies that wind turbines use to reduce loads or you know, improve yield. And we're seeing how those types of strategies and philosophies can apply and start to de-risk them for our own application. And in some of these instances, software being a great example, we can actually even test it directly on the O2 and get some live feedback. But this is all feeding into what we are seeing and building up confidence in terms of what we'll deliver as technology going forward and how we will see our levelized cost of energy. So it's a fantastic project for us. That's terrific to hear. And we saw some more exciting news over the last couple of weeks as well uh, with your strategic investments with um, Technique, FM, Technique FMC. Um, what does that mean for Orbital O2, uh, Orbital and the O2 going forwards? Well, I mean, for, from an outset, from an investor perspective, I think it's a huge validation of the vision and the technology that we've created at Orbital Marine Power, that an entity that specializes in and is seen as a world leader of um, technology in the marine space, delivering complex um, technologies that work in the marine space. The endorsement for us is huge. Uh, for us as a business going forward, clearly it brings uh, a new skill set to the table and one that we, you know, that is really important for us. We've spent 20 years innovating a really good piece of technology here. The next phase of our chapter. The next chapter in our book is about delivering and executing commercial projects. And really in the marine space, there's few companies that bring more resource or more expertise to the table than Technip FMC. So for us, huge endorsement, but really also very exciting about bringing a new set of skills to the table to let us um, execute and deliver commercial projects and start to bring that levelized cost of energy down. 
And and I suppose one of the I guess the recognitions of this validation, as as you um, so eloquently put it, is the exciting announcement last week that there is now a ring fenced CFD pot for tidal stream energy. Um, I guess you've had about a week to to kind of think on this and reflect on it now. What are your uh, initial reactions? Delight. <laughs> you know, um, again, um, when we conceived O2 out the back of the build experience and early experience of the SR2000, which was five years ago and six years ago, and it's actually when the UK government decided that it wouldn't support marine sector anymore, uh, wave or tidal. And so I don't think it's a quirk of timing that the UK has come back, UK government has come back and favorably reconsidered its position out the back of what we've demonstrated and built. Um, you know, and that's, that's two key things. One, uh, the O2 was built with over 80% of UK supply content. So this is an industry that the UK is well positioned to grow an industrial um, basis around that has got global export opportunity. So I think that is clearly a great thing um, for building uh, back greener, but also helping with a just transition here from the net zero. Um, but I think also in terms of our levelized cost of energy, I think uh, the UK's position, again, the UK government's position, I think has been influenced by a realization that there is a different proposition on the table right now in terms of how this can, how this can make a return at a cost affordable level. So um, delight because it is the mechanism that we need to pull more investment into the technology and into projects and deliver them successfully here in the UK. Um, and I also think it's, a, again, a big validation of what we've generated and delivered over the last 12 months. Yeah, I think that um, the demonstration that the UK can, can seize a significant economic opportunity from it as well through both orbital and its supply chain is, is vital. Um, yeah, so just, it's a I think it's, you know, it's a, a socioeconomic impact or a benefit that hasn't yet ever been seen in the UK, delivering technology from a UK industrial base. And it is a multiplier effect. And when I say multiplier, we, ex we expect it will be in the order of magnitudes more than what's been seen in other spaces like wind and solar. So delivering 100 megawatts of tidal stream will have a similar socioeconomic effect from a manufacturing execution capex perspective uh, as delivering a gigawatt of offshore wind, if not more. And I'd just like to pull one last question from the chat as well before we start to wrap up a little bit. Um, and, you know, clearly tidal stream is a very exciting sector. And, and you know, I think um, uh, some of the younger members of the audience are really alive to this. So we've got a question saying, what opportunities are there for, for graduates in the sector? Um, it's obviously, you know, a very sought after place to be. So have you, have you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a frustrating one in a way, because I'd love to be able to harness the enthusiasm. Um, I, I myself, you know, got in this space 20 years ago as, a, as nearly a fresh faced graduate. Um, and it, I've added, added a few gray hairs over the years. But, um, you know, one of the frustrations is, is that we've been kind of, you know, been stymied by a lack of market. And so it's meant that we've just delivered one off machines and projects to this point. You know, I would like it's not going to be overnight. But, you know, this step change, both for us as a business and as an industry with a market, our objective is to build lots of these things and, and grow an industry. And that means grow jobs. So I certainly hope in the days, weeks, months and years ahead, we're going to see the opportunities grow for graduates and people in existing work to transition into the tidal space, because it is a great uh, rewarding space to work in. It's something that gets me up and enthusiastic in the morning every single morning. So I really hope that that's something that we can deliver um, going forward. And certainly keep your eyes peeled on our social media streams as well, because we will be growing head count over the weeks and months and years ahead. Thanks, Andrew and Alex. I think it's time to start wrapping things up. So thanks so much, Andrew. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you here and to talk to you and find all about Orbital. Um, no, thank you very much. Yeah, it's been great. Yeah. Hopefully everybody find um, it interesting. It's really nice to see the tidal sector finally gain some momentum and it, every year we do get further and further. So um, for all our viewers at home, all it remains to say is tune in at the same time next week using the link provided when you registered and the Tidal Power Express will stay in Scotland.
and also touch on sites in Japan, China, India and France when we talked to Drew Bax and, and Philip Archer about the story behind CMIC Atlantis. So yeah, please do keep in, up with our social media channels and we'll see you next week. And lastly, just to say, you can find out more about Orbital Marine Power on our Tidal Power Express hub and at orbitalmarine.com and all the latest news from our Tiger project as well as at interregtiger.com. Um, so all the links you'll find there in the chat box. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much for joining us this week. It's been a, a real pleasure. Thank you. Thanks everyone.